Welcome to the Creative Community Podcast, presented by Destination Arate. I'm David. And I'm Mark. And we are building a community of people who work together to achieve creative excellence. Today's episode is an interview with portrait artist Brian Nair. Now, Brian is a highly accomplished portrait artist. His work has been um, shown at the Portrait Institute in Manhattan, New York, and he's been featured in multiple art magazines, uh, including American Artists and Portrait and Figure Painting highlights as well. Brian has also received recognition in the Natural Por uh, National Portrait Competition and the West Coast Society of Portrait Painters. So without further ado, uh, we're going to introduce Brian. Welcome to the show. So hello, Brian. How are you? Hey, guys. How's it going? Good. Would you <laughs> Good mind? To be here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for having this conversation with us. Would you mind telling us a little bit about uh, your yourself and then maybe something that you've been working on recently? Sure. I, uh, as they said, I'm, I'm Brian Nair. I'm a professional portrait painter. Uh, I've been painting portraits for probably about 20, I guess going on 25 years now. Uh, and um, I am currently working on uh, a series of portrait paintings uh, for a family uh, down in Georgia. They own a, a, they own a peach farm. And so I've painted five of their grandchildren uh, working on the sixth. And I'm also painting portraits of each of the, the grandparents that are commissioning the portraits. Um, those are kind of my ongoing projects. And then I also have uh, a couple more portraits that I'm working on as well, um, along with studies for uh, upcoming portraits also. Wow, that's, that's uh, it sounds like, I mean, that kind of gives us a good leeway into our first question or, or segue, but uh, you know, all those portraits that you're doing, portrait after portrait after portrait, we saw we researched a little bit about you, what we could, and we saw that you were an illustrator starting out, and then you transitioned into portrait art. So we're curious to know, uh, you know, how did you decide uh, which one you were going to focus on for your career, and how did you end up on portrait? I guess. Well, the illustration that, that was that wasn't a very long stint. Uh, <laughs> in fact, it was it's pretty much uh, I worked at Abeka Books, uh, which was uh, the I went to Pensacola Christian College. And uh, it was during uh, my student years there when I, well, when I was a student that I actually actually did some illustrations for um, one of their science books while I was down there. Um, and it was during that time, really, uh, at college that um, although I majored in commercial art and that was kind of the avenue that I was going to uh, move into, um, it changed uh, my junior year of college uh, was when I was introduced to um, the fact that uh, portrait painting was still alive and well today. I thought it, I looked at it as more of a, um, a profession that had sort of gone with the wayside, uh, more of a late 19th century uh, profession, but uh, it is it is quite popular today, especially down south, um, the southeastern portion of the United States. Uh, there's There's been sort of a resurgence uh, in portraits and also uh, it's more of a, tr uh, a southern tradition. So it, it is there's definitely a large market for portrait painters. That is really fascinating. Um, I'm curious to know, I was talking to an, an artist the other day and he was talking about how the, uh, we were talking about landscape painting and I was asking him, you know, why aren't there, you know, great landscape paintings of the South, you know, kind of in that, in that tradition. And he said, well, in the 1890s, which is around the time that we, you know, you and I tend to like that era of art, that there was no money in the South because the reconstruction was happening. So uh, it's super cool to hear from you that the, you know, even though the landscape market, there might not be that, that history there in the, in the South of portrait market, there is that history. So that's really cool uh, to hear about. Can, can you like, do you know why that, that tradition was able to continue through that, that rough period? I am not sure. I mean, it's just uh, a lot of the, of the families that I paint, uh, each generation just seems to have gotten a portrait painted and, and they, they just keep carrying on the tradition. I'm not quite sure um, why, but I'm thankful for it because yeah. uh, it keeps me in business. But uh, uh, the, really the South is also uh, a big market for uh, family portraiture. Okay. Um, a lot of children's uh, portraits, um, you, you get a lot of family portraiture. The, the, the further uh, Northeast you go, it's more of um, government uh, portraiture. It's more, um, corporate work. Okay. Uh, and then I've seen that the further west you go, uh, the further west, the more obsolete it seems that portraiture becomes. So. And did you know that you wanted to be a portrait artist when you came to college? 
I, I had no idea that, that that's what I would go into, actually. Um, when I was younger, uh, like every artist, uh, you always hear, well, if you can draw or paint people, um, they're the hardest subjects. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you can do that, um, then you should be able to, to draw or paint any other subject. And so that's kind of where I started uh, thinking about, you know, hey, if I'm going to be an artist, I should probably learn, learn how to draw people. And I actually had a, a grandmother who is uh, really my first inspiration. She was a commercial artist uh, as well. And she, uh, I used to watch her draw when I was younger. Uh, and that kind of motivated me as well. But um, uh, as far as portraiture, I had no idea until I got to college. And it was during my junior year, uh, if you can't tell, the junior year of my of my um, college days were was sort of a pivotal year for me. Okay. Um, because Brian Jekyll was one of my um, art instructors down at college. And he had recently done a thesis on the work of another portrait painter named Joe Bowler. And Joe Bowler was a uh, a famous illustrator. He did a lot of uh, covers and illustrations for uh, Ladies Home Journal, um, McCall's, uh, all those magazines back when they used to illustrate the um, covers and the stories as well inside of the magazines. Uh, and it was such a big deal that they used to give the uh, illustrators a, a two-page spread. So basically, Joe would have two pages to do an illustration uh, for each issue that he did. And it was a pretty amazing um, thing back then. And then uh, photography came in and, and sort of took over that, that side of the business. And so uh, Joe moved into uh, to portraiture. And, um, but anyhow, uh, Brian Jekyll had done his uh, thesis on Joe Bowler. And uh, he came back and he shared uh, uh, his experience going down to Hilton Head to visit Joe in his studio. And he wanted to share that with one of his classes. And um, I was in one of those classes where he was uh, talking about meeting this guy named Joe Bowler. And, um, and it was during that class where he showed a video and he gave all the students the option to either watch the video or to work on their current projects. And for me, I, I always love uh, watching other artists work and to, to see how they go about uh, their craft, really. And so he started this video. And so I, I decided to watch the video and um, Joe was being interviewed and then he started to do a demonstration on camera. And I'll never forget, he started out with a blank white canvas and he just started to paint, started to block this, this painting in. And within 15 minutes or so, all of a sudden this, the form of, of this little girl start, started to emerge on the canvas. And, uh, and I looked real close and I thought, there's no way that anyone could actually paint like this because I've only heard about people doing this. I've only read about it in books, but I've actually never actually seen someone do this. And so I was fascinated. And so uh, as the interviewer uh, kept asking questions of Joe, uh, I'll never forget one uh, line that he said, and it was, um, he had talked about all of the help that he had gotten um, as a young artist uh, growing up in, in what they called Cooper Studios, which was a, it was basically a large uh, building that housed all the top illustrators in New York City, and he was a part of that. Um, and so he was talking about all of the help that he had gotten coming up as an artist. And he said that if there's any young artist out there that can find a way to get to me and who needs my help, I will help them. And all of a sudden, when I heard that, it was like the bells went off in my, in my head. You know, I just thought, oh my goodness, is this guy serious? Because if he's serious, then I'm going to take him up on his offer. And then I immediately thought, oh, man, everyone in class here is going to have the same idea as me, and that is to get in contact with this guy. And so I looked around the classroom, and no one was watching the video. I couldn't believe it. And I said, are you serious? I said, well, uh, man, the first thing I do, you know, that I'm going to do when I get back to my dorm room is to go ahead and try to, to find this guy. And so I did. Uh, he, was a, he had a listed number, so I gave him a call, and we talked for about an hour. And uh, at that time, uh, like I said, I was going to school in Florida, but I actually lived in Virginia. And so he said, well, I'll tell you what, on your way back uh, to Virginia, because I was driving, he said, why don't you just go ahead and stop by my studio in Hilton Head and, I, and we'll go ahead and talk. And so I did. And when I stopped by, uh, that was really um, sort of a life changing experience for me because uh, uh, I met Joe at a time when um, a very pivotal time, I, I should say, in my life, because um, it was my junior year of um, college and I had serious doubts about whether or not I should become a professional artist, whether or not I should 
actually go for it because I had friends and family back home were, who were totally discouraging me and saying, you know, you're never going to make it as an artist. Uh, you know, when are you going to start focusing on, on getting a real job and, and, and a real profession? So it was really right before that trip to, to Hilton Head, I had made up my mind that, you know, if, if this guy, Joe Bowler, is the, the best uh, that there is, then he'll tell me if I have what it takes to either make it or not, or if I, if I, if I should even pursue it. And so I had already determined that um, when I went uh, to meet Joe, that if he said that I shouldn't pursue it, I was not going to pursue art. I was literally going to um, go in a different direction. But if he told me that, you know, that I had some uh, something, you know, that it, then I would continue to pursue it. And so I went down there and met Joe, an incredible experience um, uh, that I spent time in his studio, you know, talking with him about art and artists and portrait painting. And, uh, and then he and his wife, Marilyn, took me out to, to dinner that night. And um, when we were out at dinner, we were talking about some of the old illustrators that he had uh, worked with and some of the old illustrators that he admired uh, that I admired, uh, some of the great painters also like John Singer Sargent, Anders Zorn, uh, Joaquin Soroya, all these different painters. And I'll never forget, uh, as we were talking about these great artists, Joe looked at me and he said, Brian, um, when you look at the work of these other artists, he said, even my own work, and he was talking about, you know, his, his portraits, he said, don't determine that you're going to paint as good as them. And when he said that, I could almost feel the lump in my throat uh, because I thought, oh man, this is where he tells me uh, you don't have what it takes, you know, to be to go into to be a portrait painter, or, or why don't you go ahead and, and think about something else? But he totally surprised me, and he leaned for, forward on the table and he looked at me. Uh, he looked me straight in the eye and he said, "Determine that you're going to paint better than they did, and someday you might surprise yourself." And mm -hmm. he said that that's how he had approached art all of his life. And at that moment, I got a glimpse into what it was like to be a professional and to have a professional mindset. Because at that moment, I realized that Joe wasn't just trying to be as good as a John Singer Sargent or as good as, you know, Anders Zorn. He wanted to be the very best, not just the very best of his era, but the very best, you know, throughout time. And so I could, I could kind of see the mindset that he had and it really changed my whole aspect on, on how I looked at art and how I approached it. So um, I think that's a long answer to, uh, to your question, but I hope that helps. <laughs> no, that is, that is fantastic um, that he was able to mentor you in that way. And um, I'm curious to, to dig a little bit deeper into the, the art history side of that that conversation, because if anyone has followed you on Instagram, which I totally recommend doing, um, your Instagram is populated with all these different artists, the great artists from history. Um, and you you also post your own stuff on there. But I have really come to appreciate the content that you put up because sometimes it's like, OK, yeah, so and so is doing this. They're producing all this work, you know, but then you all of a sudden it's a Brian Nair post and it's just a JC Line Decker sitting there that's just, you know, just so good, so sweet, and you're like, oh, that's what I needed today. So can you talk a little bit about your philosophy for, you know, like doing that on your Instagram and then also just how art history has affected you? I know I, I'm, I'm really wanting you to kind of continue that conversation where Joe said, you know, be better than, than, than the past. Sure. Well, I do, I do the, the, the postings on Facebook and Instagram uh, for just the reason that you had just said. Okay. Uh, there are a number of different reasons, but one reason is to inspire other people, other artists, because there, um, there's so much great work uh, that has been done in the past that people just are not, are not aware of. Um, and so really, by knowing Joe Bowler um, and even Brian Jekyll, they, they introduced me to some, some great painters, some great illustrators. And I tend to put illustrators and, uh, you know, these painters like John Singer Sargent, I, I tend to put them all kind of in the same category. There are a lot of people that will separate, you know, well, this is illustration and this is fine art. Well, they, the only difference between illustration and fine art is the intent, really. Uh, illustration was, you know, someone commissioned them to, to do a certain story or something like that, and they did it. But some of these guys, the illustrators, I really give them tremendous credit, uh, especially during the 20th century, because 
they actually carried the torch for representational art when the whole modern art movement came into being. Yeah. I, I believe that if it wasn't for those um, great illustrators, you know, I think a lot could have been lost in the 20th mm -hmm. century as far as representational art goes. But you had guys that understood drawing, they understood values, color, edges, they understood design, they, they could comp uh, compose beautifully. And most of all, they could draw. Uh, the draftsmanship was, was, was excellent. And that's really the thing that I, I, I tend to stress with, with artists, um, young artists especially, uh, focus on the drawing. Uh, don't, don't rely on mechanical methods such as a, a, you know, a projector to project your, your drawing up there thinking that you're going to um, save time uh, you know, because the drawing is, is kind of the boring part. Let's get past it and just get right to the painting. Yeah. But the thing is, if you don't learn how to draw freehand, you really do yourself a disservice and you're actually ending up hurting yourself in the long run because you've never, because what, what takes place in drawing is that first of all, you're, the, all of the information that comes to you, uh, you're, you're collecting all that information with your eyes. So you have to be able to see all, the, all of that information, but then you have to simplify it down. You, you can't just paint every little detail. So then it becomes an editing process. So you take the information in through your eyes and then your mind has to filter a lot of that out. In other words, you have to decide what am I gonna leave out and what am I gonna put in uh, as far as the drawing goes. Once you come up with that uh, mental picture in your mind, then your hand has to execute that uh, onto the canvas or onto the paper. So really it's a three-step process. You're seeing, you're interpreting, or you're, you're editing in your mind, and then you're also executing with your hand. So if you just project a drawing up on a canvas, you're bypassing all of that. You're not, you're not looking at your, at your subject. All you're doing is literally tracing something like an outline of something. And it, it totally, it's a different process altogether. And so then when you actually get to start painting, you, you don't understand the interpretation part of it. You don't understand the scene. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't work out quite as well. So don't become a, a slave, I guess I should say, to, to a mechanical device like, a, you know, like a, a projection or a projector. Uh, be able to learn how to draw because really drawing is the foundation. It's really um, the underpinnings of, of any great uh, representational work of art. I keep going on here. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's that's great. Yeah, all of this information is wonderful, and I'm so grateful for you being just like open and honest. That story about Joe Bowler was amazing, and I kind of want to circle back to that, not to ignore the the sure. technical art side, but if I'm if I'm a young artist today, you know, put put yourself as a junior in college today, is that the same method of of getting better or do they just need to go find a mentor that they admire and reach out to them what advice would you give to someone that's like i need mentorship where do i start how do i even begin to to figure that out in in today i would give them the same advice that that i that i did myself and that was uh find the best in your field and find out find out who you like who you admire whose work that you really would would like to um imitate or, or mimic in, in a way that, you know, you want to get to a certain level and, and find someone like that and then find a way to get in touch with them, to, uh, to get in contact with them. And uh, not every door is going to be open, uh, but you just never know. I mean, I'll be honest, when, when uh, before I met Joe Bowler, I actually tried with two other illustrators, um, guys you'll be familiar with, uh, Howard Turpening. Um, mm -hmm. He's a big uh, Western artist. I actually contacted him, but uh, he didn't have enough to do uh, in terms of um, for an apprentice. Uh, and, oh, okay. and, and, and a, an apprentice was, I kept reading about these old, you know, these old painters and how they were apprentices. And so uh, that's, that's kind of the approach that I wanted to take as well. But a lot, that's sort of a, a lost uh, form of education, I guess, in, in, in today's world. Um, but I still tried it. I, I still, you know, tried to see if I could do it. And so I contacted Howard Turpening and Turpening and, and that didn't work out. And then I contacted uh, another illustrator, Tom Lovell. Okay. Um, I actually spoke with Tom twice on the phone and very generous man. Uh, but again, he didn't have enough to do around his studio for an apprentice. Um, and so uh, he directed me towards his books, which he had written. But uh, even in talking um, uh, on those phone, on those two phone conversations with Tom Lovell, the one thing that he emphasized and stressed was the same thing that Joe Bowler did, and that was drawing and, mm -hmm. um, and, and draftsmanship and being able to uh, really uh, just 
concentrate and, and perfect that that aspect of um, of art. But uh, that's what I, I would I would try to find the person that you admire. Uh, that you look up to and then find a way to get to them. It could be through social media. It could be through, I mean, if they're listed, you can, you can give them a call. There's all sorts of different ways. Uh, I tell artists there is no better time in history to be an artist than right now. And that's because of the internet. You can, um, you can reach out to artists. You can uh, contact them in, in ways that uh, you would never, uh, ways that I never would have even thought of when I was a, a student but yet they're more accessible these days. Um, and then also uh, because of the internet, you also have a, a platform, uh, a worldwide audience where you can show your artwork in ways that um, only these artists uh, from the past could ever dream of. Because in order to get their work shown back in those days, they had to go to a show or a salon or, or a big show each year. And they, they relied on patrons coming into those shows. Whereas you can send your work out to the world these days without, without even leaving your studio. So. Um, does that kind of answer your question a little bit? Yeah. And I actually wanted to know, did you, had you put the work in that gave Joe Bowler the idea that you were willing or you were worthy of being invested in, or did he just, did you just get him at the right time? Like, is there a balance between proving that you're worthy of being invested in, or is it, is it really up to whether or not the artist you connect with is, is available? Um, Honestly, I don't know what Joe saw in me. I think he may have seen a little bit of himself uh, in, in terms of the eagerness, maybe, to want to learn. Um, uh, I, I took him uh, several drawings uh, that I had done as a student and also some paintings. But again, this was student work, so it wasn't like professional work. So these are just my own, own drawings and paintings uh, for, you know, projects for a class. But um, for whatever reason, he... he just kept inviting me back to see him. Um, and uh, I don't, I, I, I'm not quite sure why he, why he did that, but I'm so thankful because you talk about timing. I, I actually caught Joe at, I couldn't have asked for more perfect timing. He was at the height of his career. He was about 65 years old when I met him and he was painting the best portraits of his life. I mean, it was unbelievable. I can't even explain to other people uh, the quality of his work. Um, and then I was at the very beginning of my career. It hadn't even started. Started. I was still in college. And so um, here Joe was at the very height of his, his career. Really, he didn't have time to spare. I mean, he was doing paintings left and right, but yet he took the time uh, to look at my work and to go ahead and be a mentor to me. Um, and I mean, he spent so much time with me. Uh, I would just go down there and, and sit in his studio and watch him paint for hours mm -hmm. and just ask him questions. How, how do you do this? Why are you mixing it this way? And I would just basically just ask every question along the way because I wanted to ultimately figure out um, how, how is he thinking? What, what is the mindset and the, and the thinking of a painter? I don't want to just know how to do a technique because, you know, you can learn how to do one or two techniques and that, and that might apply to a certain type of painting or a certain section of a painting. I want to learn why he's making the decisions that he is and so that I can take that same approach and figure things out myself on my own subjects, if that makes sense. And so it was, um, it was just a, a great relationship. I studied under Joe for 23 years and uh, I couldn't have asked for a better mentor. He was so uh, encouraging. If there's one word that I could use to describe Joe, it would just simply be inspiring. And that's really what it was all about for him. Uh, he, he just loved to inspire people and just watching him paint and, and hearing, hearing him talk about some of these great painters of the past. Uh, it was by the time I left that studio, I was just, I wanted to pick up a paint, a paintbrush right then and there. I mean, I was just <laughs> pumped and ready to yeah. go. So, and that's really what, you know, posting those, those, those painters of the past that I call them on, on Facebook and Instagram, I'm just trying to help inspire others so that when they see a painting that they, that they really like, it may not be the certain style, you know, that they do, but something about it inspires them to say, hey, let me let me just push myself a little more towards, you know, my own goals because of this, you know. And so it's really about inspiration uh, and, and encouragement uh, when it comes to the postings uh, as well on, on Facebook and Instagram. 
I, I firstly really appreciate that you that you do do that with your Facebook and Instagram because I know for me sometimes especially if you're you know you're seeing your peers posting it can be like oh man you know there's that competitiveness where you're like oh they're they're cranking out more work than me or you know and that can be good but can, with social media it can also get unhealthy but with the uh, with the the painters of the past you know they're at least they're out of the race you know they're they're not competing <laughs> for the same jobs that you are so. Um, yeah. That, that well, is super helpful. To, to your point there, so another reason for, for posting the painters of the past as well is because it gives me unlimited content to post yeah. rather yeah. than posting. I don't have enough of my own stuff to just post every single day. And, and, and personally, I, I, I get kind of tired of seeing if it's just one person's stuff, you know, all the time. Uh, that's really why another reason why I post, uh, you know, the, those, those paintings because you have limitless content. You can always post great stuff. And so uh, that's another reason as well. Yeah, that's awesome. We we wanted to transition. We're super, like, super grateful that you were able to talk about your your mentorship with Joe and the, 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 the ways that he taught you and things. We wanted to transition into a little bit of a different aspect of community, which is um, how you balance your time in the studio versus your time communicating um, with clients, going out and looking for new clients and interacting with your own art community. Um, cause I, w at the beginning of the episode, you stated like how many different projects you had going on and that like, you're like, okay, I got a portrait for this family. And if that's like this many, and then I have, so we're curious to know how do you balance time actually working on, you know, the physical act of painting versus time, you know, going out and do, how do you search for clients, those sort of things? Uh, well, when it comes to studio time, uh, that's really an important part. So every time I'm in the studio, uh, I have to, I have to be totally focused. Um, especially, uh, you know, not so much now, but with younger children, you know, a few years ago, uh, it was, a, it was a tough balance between family and, and being able to, to paint portraits. You've got, there's, there's more demands on you as well. So, um, no matter how much time you have, whether it's, you know, an hour or two or a full day of painting, a full week, whatever time you have, make sure that you put everything that you have into that time that you've been given. It's not about uh, the quantity of time of painting, you know, it's, it's not about how long, how many hours you paint, it's what you put into those hours. Mm -hmm. And that is really vital, I think, to understand um, and also, uh, you know, along the lines of, you know, Joe Bowler, he taught me um, being a professional, there are going to be days when you don't feel like painting. Mm. Uh, I don't feel like, I don't feel inspired every time to sit down and paint. But the thing is, if you're going to be a professional artist, it doesn't matter whether you're inspired, inspired or not, you need to sit down and just do the work. And as you start doing the work, it's amazing. As you start to get into it, you become more inspired. Uh, and so it's just that that whole mindset of, OK, I've got to sit down and at least get going here. And, and once you get going, then then it's it's much easier. But uh, uh, but in terms of studio time, uh, that's really the balance. It's finding the balance. Uh, it's just uh, it's not as much of, a, of an issue uh, as far as family and, and um, painting portraits these days, because my because my children are older. Uh, but uh, whatever time you have in the studio, uh, just just put everything that you have into it, whether it's just an hour or two or, you know, a full, a full day. And as far as uh, clients go, I, I don't actually, I actually don't go out and find clients. Um, so at the beginning of, of this year, I was already, already booked up for the whole year. So I put on my website that I wasn't taking any new commissions until spring of 2021. And just because I had so many portraits to do, I just knew that it, I, I can't do that. And so you can't just keep stacking up portraits because you know people are going to be going to be waiting for these things. So I I, I couldn't do that. Um, so as far as advertising goes, really, I, I don't do a lot of advertising. A lot of people, most people, find me, I guess, on my website um, okay. through my website. But then also the social media avenues, uh, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, people find me on there because, uh, and that's another reason for posting stuff on those outlets is because. You need to go where your audience is. And right now, your audience is, regardless of age, they have a device in their hand. They're online all the time. And so if you can just take your work to them, you've got to be in the, in the places where they are in order to show your work. Don't expect people to come to you 
uh, or, or for someone else even to show your work. You need to take the initiative and, and put yourself out there and, uh, and have your work in front of people. And so uh, really through the website, uh, social media avenues as well, but I, I, I really uh, use the social media also as a sort of a roadmap to my website. So when people go to the social media, it might generate enough interest for them to say, hey, who's this guy, Brian Nair? Let me go check his stuff out. Uh, and so then they go to the website and then when they're on the website, then they can look around and, and, and who knows, they might, you know, give me a call or, or send me an email uh, wanting to commission a portrait. But uh, uh, I don't do a lot of, a of advertising, but um, um, one of the things that I do, I guess, when, if I was to do advertising was to would be on like Facebook or Instagram. Anytime that I post one of my own paintings, I'll, I'll boost it. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, I'll uh, pay, uh, you know, an amount to, to expose it to more people. And that seems to generate some interest as well. And I've gotten uh, commissions as a result of that also. But um, uh, does that help you out? <laughs> yeah, that's great. I really appreciate that. Um, well, we're getting close to the end of our time here. We're, we're really grateful for you coming on. But we had a listener submit a question. Uh, his name is sure. David, and so uh, this was the question we picked for the, the, the interview, but he wanted to know, uh, and this is a, a great question, but he said, what steps do you take to um, portray or represent Christ likeness when you are painting? Or is there a mindset that you have when you approach a work of art, a piece that you're doing that you think, you know, I'm going to try to bring Christ out of this in, in however way I can? And I don't know how you want to answer that, but go right ahead. I just think of one verse all the time, uh, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. And that's really, that's the verse that's kind of uh, motivated me uh, all these years, because I, I to me, it's, it's a great honor and privilege to be able to be an artist. Um, I, I didn't ask to be an artist, you know, that's how God created me. Um, and so to be able to take those, uh, uh, those skills and to, really push them to the limit um, and to, to produce the best work that I possibly can, I think is very important uh, to always strive for excellence uh, in everything that I do. And really, that's really what I do with each painting. My, my philosophy with each uh, painting is basically to make each new painting better than the last. And so if I continue to do that, uh, then I'll, I'll hopefully get better as I go along. But uh, it's really... Um, putting your best work out there. Don't let anything go out the door that's not your best work because ultimately it's my name that's going on the, um, you know, on the, on the painting. So basically it's your, it's your reputation, but also yeah, it's your testimony as well. I mean, it's, it, if you do, you know, sort of a, an okay job, it's not a great reflection on, on if you, you know, as if you did an excellent job. And if you have the abil ability to do an excellent job, then you should do an excellent job. Uh, I don't even know if that makes sense, but that's that's kind of my philosophy. Is if you're going to do it, and you're going to you're going to spend all this time on this painting. Do it the best you can. And here's uh, another thing that I should point out: um, doing your best. Uh, the the truth is, no one knows what their best is. They really don't. So in order to bring out the best in someone, it usually takes a set of circumstances or another person to bring out or a combination of both to bring out the best in a person. And so, um, you know, when they talk about, you know, well, he has the potential to, to be a great artist. Potential is, is, is one thing, but you, you have to put it into action and just have, have faith as you go along as well. So that's just kind of my little two cents there. <laughs> that is a really amazing thought. I, I love that idea because I, I've been personally sorting through like, what is, what is that idea of like doing your best? You know, how do you know when that is? And I love that idea of having, and it was, it was answered by someone next to me who was able to help me sort through that. And I think that's a perfect testament to what you're saying, where it, it takes either a set of circumstances. I think of like the, like the old illustrators where they had just deadlines, you know, and that, that brought out that, that stretched them or, or us where, you know, maybe we don't have such tight deadlines as fine artists, but we have people around us who can say, you know, you can be doing better. You can and, and critiquing us and and mentoring us like Joe did for you. So that's super awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, yeah. B before you go, you had yeah. mentioned critique, critiquing. So I, let me let me say something real quick. Uh, it's always good to have someone else look at your work as well, even if they're not an artist. Just okay. to have another eye to to examine your work. Um, my wife, uh, she's not a, 
an artist in the sense of, you know, she doesn't paint or draw, but she does have a good eye. And so if before I deliver a portrait, I'll have her take a look at it. And she sees things that I do not even consider. So I'm looking at it in more of a technical aspect and she's looking at it from a different point of view. So just to have someone else take a look at your work is, is very important. Uh, and even like with Joe Bowler, to have him as a mentor, uh, to be able to critique my work, um, find someone who's going to give you an honest evaluation. Uh, Joe was such a master uh, teacher as he was a master artist. And one of the, one of the things that I, I, I just, thought was amazing was I had seen him not only critique my own work, but critique the works of others as well. And when he would sit down with other people, he would first start out and give them some positive aspects about what he saw in their work, whether it was the drawing, whether it was the design. He always pointed out something positive. And then halfway through, he would mention something like, well, maybe over here you could do this. And then he'd go back to a positive aspect and then maybe you could do this. And then he would end on a positive aspect. So he would kind of give you the real thoughts of a critique, but he would put it, he would kind of sandwich them in, the, in between these positive aspects. So that way you're not, uh, you know, the artist isn't uh, frustrated or, or um, you know, depressed about, you know, oh, this is what I have to work on. But instead he leaves there feeling uplifted, uh, but yet knowing what he has to work on as well. Does that make sense? Absolutely, it does, and uh, I think I think it's easy to want to show your work to people and just say, "Here, it's done." And it's a better idea to show it to someone you trust and say, "Hey, I, I think it's done. What 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 do I need to do?" So that's yeah. really that's really a good a good tip. Um, Brian, would you just before you go uh, tell us where we can find you online, like your Instagram or your or your website or anything like that? You can just go to my website. It has all the information there. It's just briannair.com. It's b r i a n n e h e r dot com. Once again, we are super grateful to Brian for taking the time to be with us. Uh, be sure to visit briannair.com. That's n e h e r to learn more about him or follow him on Instagram at brian underscore nair. Uh, he posts classic pieces of art that inspire him on a regular basis. If you enjoyed this interview, be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and be sure to tell a friend that you think would benefit from what uh, Brian had to say in our conversation with him. Uh, you can follow us on social media. On Facebook and Instagram, we are Destination Arete, A-R-E-T-E. And on Twitter, we are Dest Arete. Uh, it doesn't all fit in the handle there. So um, you, you can send us some feedback, what you thought about the episode. We always love to hear from you guys. And we'll be back in two weeks with another interview like this one. See you then.